Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the first NatSpec Transform webinar of 2020. Um, I hope all of you who are joining us um, have had a good start to the new term. Uh, and welcome to the webinar, as I say. The webinars are a way of promoting an exchange of ideas, research and effective practice between uh, NatSpec members. And today I'm really pleased to have Jeff Livy from Sheeling College, who is going to be talking about his work on developing uh, a resilience curriculum. And I'm going to hand over to you to Jeff. He's going to give a presentation of about 25 uh, to 30 minutes. There'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Over to you, Jeff. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you to NatSpec for um, being part of this. I've, I've listened in to some of, the, um, some, some of the different webinars, so it's nice to be uh, delivering one. Um, you have to excuse me, I've got a bit of a terrible cold and uh, it's my first um, webinar that I'm hosting. So, you know, please do um, go easy on me. Um, OK, so I'm going to launch straight into it. Uh, the, this webinar is about the resilience curriculum, um, teaching to vulnerability. So, Essentially, this is something that I've created. Um, it's a way of looking at resilience um, by using an assessment tool and creating a tailored approach to teaching um, skills which make students less vulnerable. And then you can do lots of whizzy things with data and you can really evidence the learning that's taking place. Um, there will be lots of questions at the end. Um, so, Hopefully we'll be able to see, oh, where's my next slide? Here we go. Okay, we're on. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see the aims of this webinar. Um, I'm giving away this assessment tool that I've created for free. Um, hopefully you should be able to see that it's attached as a handout for you to download. Um, I'm going to be explaining what the tool is, how it kind of works. Um, you know, why it's different from other approaches to teaching um, skills and hopefully what it can do for you. And then kind of the second part of this webinar is really about getting some feedback from you. Um, there's an opportunity to ask questions and please do ask, ask questions at the end. And hopefully we can develop this tool um, so it can be useful for you. You can, um, you know, adapt it. You can use it within your own setting because um, as kind of specialist providers, sometimes we're always kind of reinventing the wheel. And I feel that actually if someone's done a piece of work, especially on an important thing like this, where we're trying to help people become as safe as possible. Um, you know, that's something that we really want to share. And even if it helps one student um, out there, I'm really, really happy with that. Um, so hopefully it will make a lot of sense. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction to myself. That's me with the glasses there. Um, and kind of hopefully it will contextualize a little bit from where I've come from, how I've developed this um, and how it works with my type of students, you know, our cohort. So I said, my name's Jeff Lively. I'm deputy head at the Sheeling College. Um, I'm also online safety lead and deputy DSL. We're a small independent specialist school and college. Um, we don't have lots of different curriculum development leads, lots of different people, um, you know, developing curriculums. Um, I spin many different plates here. Um, and that's obviously got some disadvantages because of the fact that I'm very, very busy, but it's also got some advantages because of the fact that actually I've got a lot of creative freedom to develop uh, very kind of bespoke tools and assessments and curriculums for our students. Um, so this is kind of what I've done to kind of contextualize what our kind of student type is like. We've got a lot of um, ASD learners We've got most of our learners are pre-verbal or um, have very um, severe kind of uh, communication difficulties, um, very rich behavior profiles. Um, so obviously they, they, they do have quite significant behavior um, at times. Uh, a lot of AAC users, 
very limited awareness of danger and are really very, very vulnerable. Um, and one of the things which I'm kind of interested in is um, this thing about subjectivity. Um, I, I know that everyone probably listening to this webinar is thinking, well, I've got very, very vulnerable students. And I'm sure that's true because I'm talking to um, people that are involved in independent specialist colleges. Um, and um, we have vulnerable students. I'm sure you have vulnerable students. Um, but there's scales of vulnerability and there is uh, lots of different things that make people vulnerable and some people are more resilient in different areas than others. Um, so kind of something that I'm interested in is kind of developing something which will have like a common language around the sector. Um, and maybe that will kind of, um, hopefully I'll be able to get a bit of feedback from you at the end around that. Um, okay, so I want to say about kind of how and why I came to create this um, resilience curriculum. Um, I call it a resilience curriculum. I want to make kind of quite clear that I'm talking about resilience in, in quite a broad sense. Um, I'm not necessarily just talking about mental health here. I'm talking about a wider sense of um, resilience in the sense of uh, reduction of vulnerability and coping with everyday life. Um, so. I kind of came to create this tool because being um, on the safeguarding um, board at my, my school and college, I was the only person from uh, an education background. So I was quite often asked how to present concepts like how did online safety and prevent and resilience fit into our curriculum to make our students safer. Um, and I realized that in pockets, we were doing really, really well. Um, and in those pockets that we were doing really, really well, we weren't necessarily evidencing the achievements that we were making. Um, and then in other areas, we weren't doing that well. And we were, from my opinion, falling a little bit short from um, our responsibilities to um, really embed within a curriculum um, how to keep, keep yourself safe. Um, I was giving kind of off the shelf answers, I felt, uh, like, well, within our PSHE and our RSE curriculum, we were covering bases and we were doing um, lessons and I could wax lyrical about all sorts of different lessons that I thought were really, really good practice. However, with our type of student, they need so much embedding of their learning that actually a lot of the things that we were doing was kind of actually just kind of skipping along the surface and not really getting to the bottom of actually um, embedding skills for them to make them safer. Um, so I want to kind of talk a little bit about what I mean by resilience. Like I said, I'm not just talking about mental health. Um, obviously, resilience is a buzzword at the moment for very good reasons. Um, you know, mental health is something that it affects a lot of people. Obviously, it affects a lot of people with learning disabilities. It's very difficult for um, you to always diagnose um, when you're talking about complex learning disabilities. Um, but it is something that is very prominent. I'm, I want to state really clearly, I'm not a mental health uh, professional in any sense of the word. Um, I'm really approaching this in a bit of an analytical way because I've got some experience about assessment and within education. Um, so I just kind of took a bit of a common sense approach and kind of went, well, resilience in a wider context, what does that mean for our students? What makes our students vulnerable? And the sort of things that came up was reduction of obsessive compulsive behaviors and things like being able to keep one's clothes on and coping with noisy environments and saying no to unwanted situations and all sorts of things that actually were really making our students vulnerable. Um, and in the most part, we were very good at addressing these things. We, as specialists, as a specialist provision, um, and 
as a broad statement, specialist provisions in the whole are very good at developing these skills with people. What I don't think we're necessarily good as a sector is, is evidencing all this fantastic work that we're doing. Um, usually when we're evidencing things like coping um, skills or uh, reduction on, in vulnerability skills, these are often kind of lost in a narrative of an annual review report. Um, actually, reduction in, um, in things that make you vulnerable on developing these resilient skills are really some of the most important things that we do with our students. They are really kind of the most important things. They keep people safe. And actually, like I said, in the most part, actually specialist provisions are pretty good at doing these. Um, certainly if you're comparing that to more mainstream provisions. Um, and that's for a number of complex reasons like our individualized curriculums using things like ILPs. Um, but I think across the board, a lot of people say that actually we, we're not necessarily evidencing that that well. Um, so like what I've said, obviously we are quite good at doing some of these things. Um, you know, these sorts of things are covered within PSHE and RSE curriculums. Um, so you might be thinking, well, what's the problem? Um, you know, I think kind of the fundamental problem is if you speak to teachers within SEN and you say, what's your favorite subject that you like to teach? I guarantee you, most of the time, they won't say PSHE and RSE. But really, it's one of the most important things that we do teach our students. So kind of why is that? And the sort of answers you're gonna get is, well, actually a lot of the things that I'm trying to teach my students, you know, that it goes over their heads. Um, most of the content that you kind of find within these schemes of work is a bit too complex for my top particular learner or it's pitched, you know, really at the wrong level. Developmentally, it might be more appropriate for children and we're dealing with adults. So it might take you a long time to kind of adjust these things. How do you assess this stuff? You know, actually there's one thing doing a lovely lesson on um, teaching people to be safer, but actually it can be quite tricky to assess um, without kind of putting them into, you know, potentially dangerous situations. So how do you really prove that the learning's happened? And on the whole, I felt that actually for very good legitimate reasons, people were feeling like they were doing a lot of box ticking without really delving into the real issues deeply. Um, and what I mean by that is I felt that and, you know, I speak from experience in doing this. You look at a curriculum within PSHE or RSE and you go, this is all really important stuff. I've got to cover all of this stuff. And in school, there's very good reasons why you have a broad curriculum. But when you're getting more towards um, college age students, you've got less time. So if you're going to cover all of your bases within PSHE and RSE, unless you dedicate a significant amount of time within your programs to do so, the chances are you're gonna cover things on very much a surface level. And there might be particular areas for some of your students that will be real issues that you really need to spend a long time addressing. Um, but you quite frankly think that, well, I don't really have the time because I've got to get on to my online safety and I've got to do a lesson about this and a lesson about that. Actually, what I think would make people safer really is to identify where, where the real issues are and then teach to those vulnerabilities and get them to a level where they are safe. And then it, obviously if there's time, maybe you can address other things, but you need to have your priorities covered. Um, so that's kind of why I felt that a new approach was necessary. Um, I'll be interested and um, you know what your views are on this because um, you know there are two lines of thought. Um, so yeah, my three kind of things 
you know, how can we get away from just, you know, this idea of, you know, tokenistic teaching of like really important subjects? How can we um, deal with this deficiency of evidence in student progress when we're making really, really important things, but not necessarily evidencing them in a way that is, um, you know, does them justice? And also um, this thing around subjectivity. Um, there's no common barometer for vulnerability. Like I said that, you know, I've got very vulnerable students. I'm sure you have very vulnerable students, but what does that mean? Um, you know, I have students that have behavior that challenge challenges. Um, you, I'm sure have students that with ch challenging behavior, what does that actually mean? Because behavior that challenges to me may be a student that may um, be physically hitting. Challenging behavior in another provision may be interrupting a teacher when they're trying to deliver a lesson. They're both behavior that challenges, but there is definitely a scale. And also within risk, and there is lots of crossover with what I'm talking about around risk assessment. And I thought that actually, in terms of risk assessment, there is a lot of subjectivity that goes on there. One of the many thing, many um, plates that I spin is I'm also quite involved in a lot of the assessment and um, referral of new students coming in. And I'll look at risk assessments and depending on the type, the student cohort at the school that I am looking at will depend on the language used within the risk assessment. And I have to really go and uh, look at that student and delve quite deeply into actually, if they think a student is medium or high risk, is that the same understanding that I have of medium and high risk? Um, and I'm not for a second, suggesting that um, you can create this one tool that is now completely address all of these things. Um, but I think it's worth having a go at developing some form of common barometer across the sector and that would benefit everyone. Um, so where did I start? Essentially, I started kind of listing a whole bunch of different things that made my students vulnerable. And you can see um, there's a lot of things here and I'm sure that some of these things will be very familiar to you in your provisions. Um, and some may be more or less um, prominent in your provision. So, um, you know, these are the things that make our students very vulnerable. And once I was starting to kind of write them all up, I realized that there was a kind of categories emerging. Um, so I've got different categories. I've got you know, protection. So the ability to protect yourself from um, physical dangers. I've got prevention. So the ability to prevent dangerous situations. I've got coping. So the ability to actually just cope in, in everyday life. And then um, I initially just started with those three and then I realized the elephant in, a, in the room was, um, the thing that makes a lot of my students vulnerable is the behavior and actually that kind of warranted a section of it on, on its own um, and there's lots of crossover with all of the different areas um, and we could kind of debate this for quite a long time um, and if you improve one area, it may have a knock on effect in improving many of the other areas. But I don't want to get hung up on that too much at the moment. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you that process. So I was just writing down things that made my students vulnerable. OK, so once I had once I had the things that made my students vulnerable, I needed some form of assessment scale. Um, you know, I'm. I'm very much uh, a fan of education. I've, you know, I've been working in the industry in education for a long time. I'm used to dealing with scales. I'm used to dealing with assessing people to different levels. I'm used to baselining a student, putting in some interventions and some lessons, and then reassessing them 
and seeing the lovely progress. And with that, you can get all sorts of lovely visualizations and things like that. So I thought, well, why is no one approaching this with vulnerability? Maybe they are, and maybe no one's telling me, um, which is entirely possible. Um, but I thought, right, okay, I could, I could spend ages searching for something that might fit my students, or I could just write it. So I wrote a scale. It's a six point scale. I, you know, from my experience, I realized that having a six point scale is generally preferable than having a three or a five point scale because people do like to sit on the fence. And if you write descriptors and you have a scale, you have a means of doing some form of assessment. So this is my assessment scale. So generally six is very, very high risk. And one is very, very low risk. Um, typically, but not always, the people that have very low ability um, tend to fall on the six areas, you know, from six, five and four. The people with more higher abilities, people with a bit more awareness around the dangers um, would be in the three, two and one areas. Um, I say typically because it's not always. I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking, actually, some of my higher ability students are much more at risk than some of my lower ability students. Um, and that is for a range of complex reasons. Uh, it may be the support, it may be their abilities actually mitigate them from certain things, um, certain exposure to some risks. Um, okay, we'll delve into that a little bit, but I just wanted to show you that's our basic scale that, that we use here. Um, and this is um, obviously really transferable to, to a risk assessment scale. Okay, so once I have my scale, once I knew all of my different, um, my different categories under each domain, I did the kind of laborious task of writing out descriptions under each of the areas. So this is just one example, road safety. It's a nice kind of simple example because um, I'm sure most people would be familiar with students that present, you know, extreme risks around roads and uh, other students that have no risks around roads. Um, so I've written different descriptors under each heading. And the idea is you use this as an assessment tool to find the best fit for your student. So you're reading the descriptors. You won't necessarily find all of the descriptors will match your student, but you're looking for best fit. You're going, okay, well, they present a very high risk around roads. I know this because actually a lot of the strategies we put in place, um, you know, they, they aren't always consistent at keeping them from not running into the road. Um, they're quite difficult to block. Um, and you might read the two on the either side and you go, okay, well, I'm happy with that. Um, you know, this, I, I understand this is somewhat subjective as well. Um, however, uh, if you want to kind of gain consistency, if, if one person is doing this assessment um, and they're consistent within themselves, you can still basically monitor progress or, or not. Um, I would suggest gaining consensus by asking people like parents and carers generally know um, people very well. Um, I would suggest getting to know the student quite well before you really even um, go into assessing this level of risk. Um, what is different from this to a normal risk assessment is actually we are taking into account that there are some control measures already in place. Um, you know, typically our students aren't likely to be walking around unsupported um, unsupported by, by staff without any kind of control measures in, in place. Uh, if they were, they would very much be on that one category. Most of our student cohort, um, you know, we're not, we're not going to see the, the ones. And in certain different areas, road safety maybe not, but in a lot of different areas, actually some of the extreme risks areas, they, you might not actually see them within your 
college. But that's okay. Like I said, at this, we don't want to get bug, bogged down by some of this stuff. We're just looking at what best fits your particular student. So I wrote this, these descriptions for all of the different areas that you saw, um, and they're they're free to download on the um, on the panel. So you know, if this is helpful to you, um, please do use this. Um, I wanted to use this example here, um, vulnerability to influence. Um, this is an area where actually, um, typically, someone with a higher ability might be more at risk. If you are thinking about something like vulnerability to for, to influence through something like social media. Now, some of our students have no ability to read, have no ability to, um, to speak. They are totally dependent on uh, the staff to help them communicate and help them to access things. So a lot of our students here won't have things like social media accounts because they've got no real ability to use them in a productive way. Therefore, actually, they're mitigated for some of those risks. Actually, for something like vulnerability to influence, a lot of our um, students that are on um, the higher ability end tend to be more vulnerable. So they may well be, a, be seeking friendships, looking to impress people. They may um, be quite compliant, but un understand how to follow quite um, complex instructions, uh, but not necessarily have the capacity to understand the risks that are associated to that. So, um, you know, don't fall into the idea that everyone who is um, you know, least stable is always going to be um, most vulnerable or the other way around. Um, you do have to read the descript descriptions. OK, um, so once you've got a scale and once you've got all the descriptions of the different areas, you can kind of start baselining and in, in the same way you might baseline someone for functional skills or independence. Um, you can baseline someone for their vulnerabilities. Um, and I've got a very simple way of doing this. Uh, it's, it's literally just, uh, and again, this is available for, for you to um, download. You can, you can literally just plot it on an Excel document and it will create a graph. And what you can see, this is, this is a real student that I've um, used as an example. Um, there is certain areas that you can see are, are, are peaking. You know, they're, they're, they're really actually showing clear peaks on our graph. So those are our priorities to be worked on. You know, this is telling my staff what should be the priority for sessions such as PSHE, RSC. You know, what should you be working on as part of someone's ILP? Um, this tool visualizes this in, in, in a way that actually really clearly shows, all right, okay, that's great. You know, I, I now know these are the things which are really, really making this student very, very vulnerable. Um, then my next kind of stage is using a curriculum tool that links to the assessment document. So we, we've identified the areas that need to be worked on. Then I've got a, a curriculum tool that has each of the areas broken down into supporting tools and equipment. So that could be physical stuff. So more control measures that you could put in place that could help make that student less vulnerable. Um, but really importantly is the activities. So learning activities that you can do to increase someone's resilience in that area or reduce that student's vulnerability. So um, I've, not, I've not shared that as part of this um, this webinar, um, because I really think that this is going to be something that's going to be quite specific to student groups. So if people want want an example, they can email me, and my my um, email will be on the on this um, slide, and I can send you some examples. But um, the idea is that teaching staff would develop that for their particular co cohort. Um, so this is a couple of examples, for instance. So stranger danger, safer strangers. 
Um, if we just look at this as an example. So this was one of the areas that really peaked. That was a real priority area. And um, so some sort of supporting tools and equipment might be um, some rules, how to act with strangers that the student can then, you know, check up and say, okay, well, am I following the rules? No, you're not. Um, or hopefully, yes, you are. Uh, visible reflective clothing. Um, you know, that could be really good because actually that could make someone safer just because if someone is liable to walk off, well, it's really, really useful for staff to uh, be able to very easily see them. Um, obviously, hopefully we'll, we would have staff that would be very much at attached to this person because we've already identified that this is a massive risk. But you know what? Using something like visible reflective clothing could be could be very, very useful. Um, sort of activities was all sorts of activities. You might do proximity activities on personal space. You might do um, drama based scenarios. And I put in a number of links to just stuff that I've done uh, with this with this student um, that uh, has made maybe a bit of a bit of a difference. Um, you know, over time, we've slowly been able to work on this. And then after that, we can reassess the student and you can see that this is quite a big success story if you look at when the student so on entry uh, the student was is represented by the blue line and on exit the student is represented by the orange line so you can see the the smaller the web the smaller the peaks on someone's resilience profile I could I refer to these as re resilience profiles um, they're just graphs, you know, the lesser the vulnerability of that person. So the, the bigger the web, the bigger, bigger the risk. OK, so it's very, very powerful to evidence your progress like this. You know, um, graphs don't get lost in narratives of reports. Um, you know, they are very, very powerful tools to evidence progress. And, you know, I really can't state that enough. Um, so what you were seeing before, that was just the prevention area of of the um, of the tool. There, like I said, there's four domains. So this is what the spreadsheet would look like once you have assessed all of the different domains. And obviously, you can see that this can really, really assist you in doing um, risk assessments as well. Um, and there's even sort of suggestions of um, kind of the typical support ratios uh, for someone, for instance, if that might run into the road or need a physical intervention if they're standing in the middle of the road. Typically, that might be someone that's two to one off site. So you can use this data to really tell a story better than just a written report. Um, you know, it really can kind of tell the story and I could use this data to really um, emphasize the sort of sort of learning that I've done to make this individual safer. Um, so, yeah, so that's the full resilience profile. I think it's a, it's quite self-explanatory. It may be because I'm very close to it because I've developed it. But, you know, to me, that really does demonstrate very clear progress with this student you know when they started off if you look at the blue line they had lots of areas where they were really very vulnerable you know they were really needing very significant interventions to keep them safe over time using learning activities we've managed to shrink that vulnerability down it's still there in certain areas it's still quite high but it's not as high as what they started OK, so in doing this as well, you can also as I, I talk about that kind of common barometer. If if someone else was using this tool, we could kind of compare things and um, we could actually talk about um, things. Well, you know, the need for physical intervention might come up because we're not just talking about the number of behavior incidents, for instance. We're talking about actually the severity or impact of 
their vulnerabilities and their um, the need to keep someone safe because of their vulnerabilities. Um, so, you know, that's super duper useful if you were doing something like um, assessment. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of open it up to questions in a bit. Um, I'm just gonna kind of speak really briefly about um, some of the things, kind of some of the questions that I've, I've already kind of touched upon and what's next for this tool. Um, kind of some of the kind of criticisms and problems that I've encountered along the way is um, one of the main things is the fact that people do get a little bit confused about um, whether this is whether this is a tool where you're looking at root causes. I'm not talking about causes of vulnerabilities here. I'm talking about um, you know kind of symptoms. I talk about symptoms rather than causes. So when you're assessing someone, actually you're just assessing someone of what you can see. Um, so for instance, it might be a case where you have a student and you don't necessarily know for certain um, around something which may be quite private. They may be a day student and uh, you might be assessing something like safe sexualized behavior. So something like, well, you know, are they vulnerable uh, due to their masturbation habits? Uh, quite frankly, if you don't know that, it's probably not a significant problem. Anyone that has been dealing with students that have that problem, um, you know, that's quite evident. Um, and you would you would easily be able to read the descriptors and track them. If you don't know, quite often you don't necessarily have to, um, have to worry too much about it. It's certainly not going to be peaking high, but you might want to dig a bit deeper with people like parents or carers. Um, so generally, I want to get as much feedback on this um, from the wider sector. You know, I'm, I, like I said at the beginning, I really want this tool to assist people, um, to make people safer. And if it only helps one person, I'm happy. You know, um, if people get back to me and say, you know what, it may work for you, Jeff, but it's completely useless for my provision. That's also okay. Um, I'd kind of want to know kind of like why that is, um, you know, could it be adapted to meet different um, student cohorts, you know, people with um, sensory impairments, people with various different mobility needs. Um, that's something that I, you know, I'm not used to. Um, moving forward, I kind of, when I was, writing this I could see it as a bit of a web-based platform because I thought that that would be really super duper helpful and useful um, for people just to track things almost in a live way um, and then I very quickly kind of realized that actually this is unbelievably sensitive data that we're, we're dealing with um, so if that was going to happen we'd really have to kind of anonymize and protect that data um, I haven't really got to the bottom of that. At the moment, I just kind of wanted to do this webinar, get it out there to as many people and for people to have a go and get back to me with feedback. Um, so please, this is your opportunity. Please ask, ask questions. I'm going to look in, um, I'm going to look in the uh, control panel and um, see whether any questions come up. So now's your opportunity uh, to ask any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff, for that uh, really fascinating presentation. Um, there are a few questions that have come up in the question box. And can I start with one which I think you, you addressed just before the end? Um, right. So I've got a question from Louise Ditch, who says she thinks this looks really good in theory. <clears throat> but some of the areas that you've displayed are not relevant for the students that she works with. And she's wondering whether she can change and adapt adapt the tool yeah so absolutely um you know i'm not i'm not precious over um over the the content in the sense of i want this to be i want to to get this out into different areas and for people to use it and have a go and if there's certain areas that are just not relevant you can obviously you can easily take those areas out you can add new areas um 
you can use the kind of template to adapt however you wish to suit your needs. Um, the only thing that I, I would say is, um, you know, I would, I would hate for something like, you know, the intellectual copyright or something like that to, you know, make people think, oh God, I, I, I better not use this, this tool because this belongs to the shielding. You know, I work for the shielding, we've developed it. We would like people to maybe credit us if they're using it, um, but please have a go at this stage. I really want this just to benefit um, the wider sector. So please do adapt. And if you can get back to me, I'm, I'm looking at, it would be really helpful if people could give me feedback maybe by, by Easter time, because I want to kind of um, do a little bit further work on, on the development. So if someone develops it, and it works for them in a slightly different way, please do let me know. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, I have uh, another question here for you from Marie Law, who says, um, if I reassess a student and the student scores higher than before, does that show regression? Um, obviously, it depends on the area. Um, like what I explained with something like vulnerability to influence, if you're dealing with something like social media, um, if you teach a student how to you how to read and how to use things like chat functions, how to you know use something like social media, that can open them up to a whole world of exciting opportunities, but obviously it opens them up to risks as well. So in actually, in certain areas, you're going to be working on skills. You may be incidentally um, allowing them to encounter more risks. Risks aren't always necessarily bad. They need to be managed, but actually we learn a lot through taking risks. So hopefully it's, it's a tool where people aren't going to be too worried Essentially, you can explain areas. So if data, if your data is showing one thing and you know the reason why, you can explain that in that narrative. Hopefully okay. that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that, for that answer. Um, I, we have um, a little bit more time if there are any other questions. Um, there aren't any more on the panel. Uh, if people want to send any more questions before we finish, that would be really helpful. Um, and while I'm waiting to see if there's anything else to come up, uh, I just wanted to add that these are uh, monthly seminars and our next seminar will be in February, which will be uh, from a colleague who works at Henshaw's College, um, who's been using the iMuse programme um, with students with uh, at the college and she's going to be talking about her work there. Uh, we'll be putting out the dates of the webinars on, on the website and they're always going to be on Wednesdays. So the date for that one I think is the 19th uh, but we'll confirm that as soon as we know. Um, I've got another question that's just come in Jeff um, yep. from Corinne van Barneveld and her question is, if you don't know the answer to something on the assessment because you haven't actually got the opportunity to see the student all the time, um, what what can you do? Well, it's a, it's, it's a good question and it is something that, um, you know, my staff do ask me, um, like the example kind of like that I gave. Uh, generally, if you don't know the answer to a question, it's likely not to be something that is very prominent. So it's, it's likely not to be a high risk area. Generally with the high risk areas, you know about them, uh, especially, uh, especially because you, people need, people are very used to doing risk assessments. People, you know, generally if you're assessing a new student, you would you would already do some form of screening, some form of assessment process as it is. I would also really say, just go and speak to parents, carers. Um, but some of these things, what I, I kind of explained, if, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, 
um, is that that old proverb. Sometimes it doesn't um, it, it doesn't matter so much if you don't know if you don't know the answer to this, you could either just leave it out of the assessment tool, or you could just score it low because that's what you can see. So you're assessing, you know, you're assessing the what you can see. Okay, thanks for that, Jeff. And a question about something you touched on at the beginning of your presentation. How, how do you, it's from Louise Ditch, how do you motivate staff that um, this is just not another thing to do on uh, an already heavy, big workload? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is, you know, if you look at this document, it looks like a really big document and it looks like a bit, oh, you know, it sounds great, Jeff, but you know what? We already got so many things going on. Um, you know, how can I take on another thing? What, I, what I'm really trying to say is this, this should not increase workload. This should just make you work smarter rather than working more. So, you know, we're really used to in this sector kind of assessing lots of different things and then teaching what's really relevant. That's why in lots of specialist colleges, we don't have um, many kind of geography or history lessons because we're working on core skills that make real differences to people's lives. So in, what I kind of say is, look, instead of having this really wide PSHE and RSE curriculum, why don't you work on just the things that are really making that individual vulnerable? You know, get them to a situation where they're not presenting really, really high levels of vulnerability. And then if after that, you can then reassess them, you can evidence what you've done, and you know what, other priorities might come up. But that's not working more, that's working, you know, that's that's taking out a lot of things and only working on the things that are really important. Does that kind of make sense? You know, so you that work- That makes sense to me. I mean, the, the, there's another linked question here, Jeff, mm. from Sarah Affinity, who says, uh, how long does it take to complete an assessment or do you do it over a period of time and adapt it when needed? Um, I have sat down and just literally written an assessment for a student because essentially all you're doing is um, circling boxes. Um, or, although I don't even circle the boxes um, because I like saving on trees, I just literally look at the uh, assessment tool and pull up the um, the profile recording sheet and then just write the number onto that. That automatically puts all your graphs together. So it shouldn't take that long. It obviously depends on how well you know the student. So I'd really suggest getting to know your student quite well, usually at the end of baseline. Like, for instance, here, our baseline is quite thorough. We're, we're assessing all sorts of different things in the first six weeks of someone being here. Um, and then we, we have a really uh, in-depth um, ILP. So this would inform that ILP. So usually it's about six weeks after someone's starting they would sit down, do the resilience curriculum. You can do it in an hour, um, but really you probably want a, a little bit longer than that to kind of agonize over some of the um, some of the areas. And you might need to ask some more people rather than doing it in isolation. Thanks, Jeff. Related to just what you said, when, when in terms of the time scale, Marie Law would like to know um, when would you reassess? Would it be at the end of term or the end of year or end of program? Well, I mean, you see the most impact um, the longer the space. So with the example that I gave, I, I, I've got to admit, I did it kind of retrospectively over. Um, so I knew this student very well. I'd worked with him over three years. So I I've, this is a fairly new tool. It's you know I've been developing it over approximately two years, um, so it's still a bit early. I would say, in an ideal world, you'd want to reassess every time someone's got an annual review coming up. So if someone's got an annual review coming up, if you reassess, you can evidence some of the progress that you're making. And what I would say as well is, even if you don't use the um, curriculum um thing you just use the uh you just use the assessment tool usually specialist provisions are very good at doing a lot of a lot of the work around developing coping strategies a lot of work you know we 
generally got multidisciplinary teams that will work with our students to help them cope in different situations, reduce their behaviours. So actually, quite a lot of the time, you will be making a lot of progress with your students. And this is another way you can evidence it. So, you know, please have a go. And if it isn't working for you, like I said, you can you can tweak it. You can, um, you know, it, it, it pains me that actually a lot of a lot of great provisions don't necessarily evidence all the fantastic work that they do. <laughs> here, here. Yes. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think we've got time just for a couple more students. There's been another. You mentioned copyright, but um, Dagmara Kanivska says, "Can teachers from different school want who want to try this curriculum? Do they need to worry about copyright?" I mean, I don't know if you want to say what you said before. By yes. acknowledging you yeah yes i mean i i it would i think it's too important what the the idea of this is to make people safer it would absolutely i would be devastated if someone thought oh well this would be useful but you know what i don't i i, I can't do it because that jeff lively might hunt me down and sue me that's not gonna happen you know uh, i want you to use it adapt it please you know, this has taken me a while to develop and um, the shielding has allowed me that um, creative space to do that. Please do just to credit this, the shielding college, just so if anyone else is looking at it, sees that it's a good um, tool to be used. And um, you can say, oh, well, you know, this originally came from the shielding that I would be super happy about that. You know, don't worry about intellectual copyright. Yeah. You know. Thank you, Jeff. And um, to close on our final questions, which comes from Sam Williams, uh, who wanted to know what ways can this tool be used to support a risk assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, um, many ways. Um, we're still kind of at the early stages here of linking everything up. Um, you know, I very much created this tool with a with you know curriculum in mind, thinking about how we can you know have a more tailored approach to um, the curriculum. But obviously, when I was doing it, I realised that actually this crosses over with um, risk assessment so well. I mean, one of the areas where I use it um, is when I'm doing online safety risk assessments. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I'm um, risk assessing online safety, I will look at vulnerability to influence. I'll look at ability to challenge unwanted situations and I'll use those scores and I'll weigh them and um, that will support um, reasons for putting in restrictive practices. So obviously, um, you know, something like online safety sometimes we do have to put on restrictions to people's devices and uses um, which can um, which you need to have a very good justification for because otherwise you're basically going against their their liberties um, you know they may want to use these things yes they have an element of risk but they might have a you know the, they may well have the right to make um, bad decisions <coughs> if you have a a scale and you have the means of evidencing that someone is really at an enhanced risk it can support putting in interventions such as restrictive practices so whether that is online safety maybe some enhanced filtering on someone's device but it could also be used to justify something like the use of higher level pis <coughs> Sorry, I'm just starting a coughing bit, but the use of something like higher level PIs, you know, we should only use physical interventions um, to keep people safe. And um, over the years, uh, Ofsted and other organisations have always said, well, you know, what is the justification of, um, you know, your use of physical intervention? And the answer should always be, well, to keep people safe. If you can evidence that the people are incredibly vulnerable and not able to keep themselves safe, it could strengthen the uh, response um, by saying, well, okay, we, they are very,